Let's pray. Thank you, Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Father, for your great love for us. Thank you, Father, we can know through reading your word and spending time in prayer and being in your presence that you are God and there is no other and that you are in control, that all things happening around us today are not cause for concern for us because we have peace in Jesus, because we are in your presence and we know, again, that you are God and you are in control and your will is being done. I pray you open our eyes and reveal to us what you have us know concerning this current present days and how to respond as your people and how to love those around us in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Yeah. So we do want to welcome the millions of you who watch us on YouTube, and especially you, Tom. We'll welcome to you this morning. Um, I think we've set him up. We can watch him every Sunday afternoon now. So we'll pan the audience. So Tom, say hello to everybody. <laughs> no. <laughs> now that's my test for Tom. Next time I see him, I'm going to ask him, "Did you watch?" Because uh, before I mention your name, <laughs> Isaiah chapter three. Still part of the introduction of Isaiah, verses one through chapters one through five. Uh, we notice in the first two chapters that God is very clearly pointing out sin, what their sin is, the result of their sin, but also His desire to redeem them, to save them if they will confess their sin and repent and return to Him. Uh, chapter two was the ultimate, as far as victory, as far as for God and God's people, uh, the end times, the last days when He will reign, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. No more war uh, and peace. It also mentions, talks about the rapture, tribulation, as also echoed in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. Chapter 3 and 4 is the statement of judgment for the people. It still follows the same pattern, though, of identifying sin, identifying the punishment of sin, an opportunity for repentance and salvation, and God's final victory in the end where he reigns supreme. Verses 1 through 12, judgment on the nations. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. The mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of the fifty and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artesian and the skillful enchanter, and I will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. And the people will be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder, and the inferior against the honorable. When a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house, saying, you have a cloak, you will be our ruler, and these ruins will be under your charge, he will protest on that day, saying, I will not be your healer, for in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You should not appoint me ruler of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. The expression of their faces bears witness against them and they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even concede it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. So to the righteous that it will go well with them for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Woe to the wicked, it will go badly with him, for what he deserves will be done to him. O oh, my people, their oppressors are children, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who guide you, lead you astray, and confess the direction of your paths. So this is the judgment on the nation of Judah and city of Jerusalem. A list of judgments are given. And it's right off the bat, it starts. He will remove the supply of support and of bread and water. Uh, food and water will be removed. And in a siege, the first thing to go is food. Now, Hezekiah does dig a underground trench, cave, to bring water to Jerusalem from outside, which helps them survive for years. But in the end, it's all removed. It's all gone, uh, which means they are destroyed. And notice how he processes through the judgment. The mighty men and the warrior, their armies are gone. There's no one left to fight for Judah. There's no army left to fight for Judah. They are destroyed by Assyria and then ultimately by Babylon, the Babylonians. It's all destroyed. They have nothing to rely on as far as man goes or people goes or their own resources. Uh, verses 2 and 3 describe civil and religious structures being removed. The military is removed. All leadership is removed. The mighty man, the judge, everything captain. They are void of leadership. And we know that when 
the Babylonians come through, what they don't kill, they take away. Anybody who has any talent whatsoever as far as a craft or leadership ability are removed to Babylon. They are relocated. And part of the reason for that is there's no leadership left that has the spine or the will or the experience to start a rebellion. They're just all, well, it's the bottom end of society. There's no motivation there or experience there or ability to stand up and lead people to, to rebel against the Babylonians. They remove all of that ability and put it in Babylon or throughout their kingdom. Uh, children will become their leaders, the text says. Uh, the picture isn't so much that an eight-year-old becomes king and runs, runs the country. The picture is more of the people who are leading the country have a childlike mentality. And they rule like a child would rule. And I can't think of a better illustration of that than our country over the last 10 years with Obama. No experience whatsoever ruled as a child would rule. Trump, say what you want about I liked his policies, but the man is a three-year-old in a man's body. His character, his attitude, his personality, he responded like a three-year-old responds. All vindictive. We're being led by, again, his policies, I think, were great for our country. You can't deny that. Look at our country under Obama, and under, under Biden. There's <laughs> a huge difference there. But either way, the mentality was that of a child. And now Biden is even worse. It's the mentality of a child. There is no leadership there. There's no nothing there. Great illustration. Well, for Jerusalem and Judah, the men are all killed or hauled off. What's left is a population of people who have no intelligence, no, no experience in leadership. At best, they were small-time farmers, and now they're supposed to lead a country, administrate a country. They can't do it. And that's the picture that the text is painting, is you'll be led by children or the mentality of a child. There's just nothing there as far as leadership quality, and that seems to be our country today. There's nothing there that gets elected that's leadership quality. The people will oppress each other, his own neighbor, will oppress his neighbor. And again, it's, there's no law, there's no leadership, there's no structure. You do what you do. And, and the picture probably is more of you do what you have to do to survive. And if I have to take my neighbor's cow so I can survive, I take it. And that's the, the picture is being painted. And the, the, the structure of the country is so destroyed, there's nothing there to help people survive. They're totally on their own. So they're taking from their neighbor. They're abusing their neighbor. Uh, youth against the elder, inferior against the honorable. Whatever is left as an elder or honorable is being overrun by anarchy, the lack of experience, the children who are now running free and running wild. This is also a picture of every culture that breaks down. When the child runs the household, woe is that household. And look at our families, our country today. Oftentimes the children are the boss, not the parents. Well, when the children run the country, and look at our country today, the cities are in the worst shape. Why? It's because the teenagers are the ones who are out doing whatever they want to do, killing each other, making it unsafe to travel at night or go anywhere. Great picture in Isaiah. We see that happening today. And our, our cities are falling apart and are being dismantled. Well, that's why. That's the picture that is there. The inferior against the honorable, the youth against the elder. And then verses 6 and 7, no one will lead. They will say, because you have a piece of clothing, you're worthy to lead us. So if your clothes are a higher price than my clothes, we'll make you king. And you lead, just because of what you happen to own. Placing leadership based on riches, on wealth, on possessions. They have nothing to turn to. They, are in, they end up with absolutely nothing in Judah and Israel to rely on as far as structure and leadership to lead them. It's an interesting picture that there's no hope in government. There's no hope in their king and their priest and what they had before the fall to rely on. And I think that's exactly where we're headed in this country, to a point where there is no hope in our leadership and our structure. Uh, one thing that we have going for us is individual states <laughs> have authority. And in the end, I think the governors will be the ones who have control. And right now, we're okay in Florida, but that could change in two years. 
But overall, in the long run, these people are relying on the leaders to take care of them, and they are relying on Assyria and then on Egypt to take care of them. And the point is, you cannot trust man for your protection, your provision, to take care of you. Your only place of trust is God. So when God passes judgment, he removes everything they were relying on to take care of them. Making the point, you chose to trust this instead of me, where are you at now? How'd that work out for you? Well, it doesn't work out at all. Verses 8 through 12, their sin, the cause of judgment, is again stated. Speech and actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence uh, in verse 8. Their speech and their actions are against the Lord. I like verse 9. The expressions of their face bears witness against them. Their very words are against God. Their very facial expression communicates their rebellion and rejection of God. Let that fall around your brain for a little bit. We all talk about communication. Actions are louder than words. If you do any study of communication, facial expressions, body language, communicates oftentimes more than words. Well, in the, in the judgment and their sin, their words clearly reject God, but so does their body language. Their facial expressions demonstrate rejection of God, arrogance against God. I mean, it's a total picture of rejection. Yes, turning away from God and doing your own thing. Their face is one of arrogance, not humility. They display their sin like Sodom. Well, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was proud of their immorality. When the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah, they tried to take them and do immoral things to them. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was known for its immorality, and they were proud of it. They had no concern whatsoever of being ashamed of it. They flaunted it. We mentioned in the last hour, that's very much our country today. You watch anything on TV and they are flaunting the immorality of this country and saying it's not sin. That is the Judeans, the people of Judah, the Israelites. They are boldly communicating and stating their sin. And that it's not sin, that it's okay. The verses say they bring judgment on themselves. It is never God's desire, God's wish, God's hope to destroy his creation. God does not want to bring judgment on his people, which is why this has carried on for so long. He gives them opportunity after opportunity to repent and come back to him. It is their choice to continually reject him and deny him and thus suffer punishment. You read Revelation. The rapture comes, the church is gone, and God unloads judgment on this planet. And the people's response is not one of humility, or submission, or repentance, but one of arrogance, the thunder knows of God as though they can overcome what's happening. Their response is hatred of God. Well, that's so people today. We talked about earlier, if you want to kind of communicate sin to someone, their response is rejection. You're being judgmental, you're being hateful. Where's that God of love you talk about? That is the people of Judah, of Jerusalem. That is the Israelites. They're just out and out rebelling, which means they bring the judgment on themselves. Verses 10 and 11, they will reap what they sow. Righteous, it will go well. The wicked, it will go bad. They get what they deserve. Uh, this is a prophecy against every civilization that's denied God throughout history. And the same pattern flows as far as the way the family unit falls apart, everything else falls apart. And it's a, a matter of, in the end, they flaunt their sin, they publicize their sin, they export their sin. That was Judah at this point. That's America today. I think the childlike attitudes that ruled this country in many places demonstrates the hole we are in, the depths of sin that we fall into. And make no mistake, we will not avoid God's judgment because we're Americans. The Israelites thought they would never have God's judgment on them because they were Israelites. Well, look what happened to them. Expect nothing less to happen to this country as we continue to arrogantly reject God and publicize and promote and be proud of our sin. Judgment on the leaders, verse 13 through 15. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. If you who have devoured the vineyard 
The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. In verse 13, God judges the people. Uh, there's no doubt, there's no question of where judgment comes from. Man doesn't make this happen. God makes this happen. God brings Assyria into Israel to destroy them and punish them and into Judah. He then brings the Babylonians into Judah to destroy them and punish them. It is God's judgment on the people. And here he is judging the leader, the elders, the princes. Uh, it's more than just the kings and the priests. It's anyone who has wealth or any influence whatsoever in the country. God is judging them. Those who have any power uh, is being judged, are being judged. They devoured the vineyard. They plundered the, the poor in their houses, which might be house, house slaves or house servants. They abused them. Crushing my people, grinding their, the face of the poor. It's a great word picture of how they mistreat people. Uh, they just did what they wanted to do with no regard to those who were their servants or their hired help. They abused them at will. The Lord stands to contend with, to judge the leaders. Uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And God is saying that he will personally judge the leadership of Judah in Jerusalem for their sin, their mistreating of people, of poor, their arrogance. Um, God's not blind to what happens in every instance, in every case, in every circumstance. And he brings judgment when he decides it's time to bring judgment. Uh, he stands and contends with the people. Uh, verse 16 through chapter 4, verse 1, judgment on the women. Moreover, the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are proud and walk with heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with menacing steps and tinkle the bangles on their feet, therefore the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs, and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. And that day the Lord will take away their, the beauty of their anklets, headbands, crescents, ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, turbans, and veils. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, a plucked-out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men will fall by the sword, and your mighty ones in battle, and her gates will lament and mourn, and deserted she will sit on the ground. For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. And verse 16 makes very clear what's going on. The women are judged because of their pride. These are the wives of the rich men, the rulers. These are the ones who torment the poor, who are servants in their homes. Uh, the judgment describes their arrogance. And it's just flat out. They were arrogant. They thought they were better than everybody else. And God will judge them for that. And I don't think we should miss the fact that oftentimes the man's action is because of his wife. She's motivating. She's pushing. She's encouraging. She's demanding. And not always, but obviously there's an, there's an impact there. That's what led Otis to be the town drunk and Andy Griffith. He was the only married man in the show, so that has something to do, I'm sure. But God's judgment is on the arrogance of the women, and women do have an influence over everything. God pronounces judgment, verses 17 through 4 1. Verse 17 is physical health is taken away from them, scabs on their heads, replaces their wealth with poverty. Verses 18 through 24, there's a long list of everything. Their dress, their wealth, their add-ons, their jewelry, their clothing, and even their undergarments, everything is being listed that it will be taken away and replaced with things of slavery and things of servitude. They will be without men, 25 through verse 4 1. They will die in battle. Women will lament and mourn their loss at the city gates. Seven women will cling to one man for a name. 
and no cost to the man. They'll eat their own food, wear their, pay for their own clothes. Just give me your name so I'm not in reproach. It's a horrible picture. If the men are taken away to Babylon in the end, the women are left behind. It's a horrible picture of just total disgust on the Babylonians' part to not even take them as slaves. They are abandoned. They lose everything. They are left to mourn and lament their state. That is God's judgment on them for their arrogance and rejection of God. In verse 9 of chapter 3, the people choose this in their rebellion against God. All this horror that comes, all this punishment that comes, they choose. For they have brought evil on themselves. And I point that out again because the God I know and love is a loving, caring, gracious, merciful God. What must I do to make that loving, caring, gracious God who died on the cross to remove my sins so I can sit in his presence? What must I do to cause him to react this way? How bad must it be in my heart and in my mind, in my life, in my character? Because this God who sacrificed his own son to remove my sins, to reject me, to throw me out. And that's the Israelites, the people of Judah and Jerusalem. They are so arrogant. They are so blatantly promoting and proud of their sin and rejection of God that God has no choice. They chose this. They chose the wrath of God. What a bunch of dingbats. How can you be in the presence of God at any point and reject that for sin, for the things of this world that are temporary, that are fleeting, that always fade? Nothing in this world gets better. It always fades. Drug addicts will tell you it's never the first high again. Most any experience you do in this world can be an exciting thing, but 10 years later, the same thing's not exciting anymore. You want something else. You gotta find some new excitement or adventure to match the first one. Nothing in this world gets better. But a relationship with Jesus only gets better. It never grows stale. It's never old. There's always new revelation with God. And think about that. God is infinite. I'm finite. I can never comprehend the infinite, which means I can never reach a point where I fully understand God or God fully reveals himself to me. I am always growing to a higher level with God. It never grows stale. It never gets old. How can I turn from that to be to a point where I reject him so badly that he wipes me out and destroys me? He sends me to hell. Once I have met God, I can't comprehend moving away from him to this. But yet these people knew how to reach God, knew how to be in his presence, and rejected that for the pleasure of things in the world, for their sin, for their arrogance. They chose this, and God brings punishment. However, despite their arrogance and their willful sin and their publicizing their sin and the pride of their sin, God still offers salvation. Uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will become holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. There will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. And I think it's another picture of end times when God rules King of Kings, Lord of Lords, as Jesus does in Jerusalem at the end. It's a picture of no suffering, not even from the heat of the sun or rain. It's a picture of everything is laid out, taken care of, provided for by God. It is that final victory for those who serve God, who submit to God, who hold themselves before God, who turn their life before God and to God and walk with Him. It's a great description 
of coming judgment that was destroyed and removed. However, in the midst of all that discussion of judgment and punishment and destruction is God's offering of hope and victory in the final days. And I would think I need that encouragement today. I need to be encouraged that in the end, God is God. There is no other. In the end, God's in control and not man, not our government, not our future government, but God's in control. Again, you read the headlines. <laughs> if I'm not a believer, I am packing up ammunition and weapons to defend my home for the coming days. But God is God. I don't worry about that. He's got this. He is my provider, my protector. protector. He's my savior. In the coming days, I think there's going to be more and more chaos. But as a believer, I trust God. Not my government to take care of. I need the encouragement that no matter how bad the unrighteous are around me, no matter how openly they flaunt their sin and thunder nose at God, as a believer, as the righteous, He will take care of us. He will take care of His people. I sleep at night because God is my God and there is no other. And He's got this. I can't imagine being in Judah during this time when God's judgment is being described and passed on the people and being a righteous man. Where does that leave me, God? Is my farm going to be overrun and destroyed by the invading armies? Where does that leave me, God? But he took care of me. He provided for me. That is God. He'll take care of us as well. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you that you are God, that we can know you are God and there is no other. And I pray, Father, you will give us peace and confidence and rest that you are God. And no matter what we see happening around us, you are in control of things. And because we are your people and your children, you will take care of us and provide for us. Father, I do say we do trust you and love you and look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.